get going here. Okay, um, so in the first session of this course, Beyond Administrative Matters, I talk some about some characteristic features of agent-based models. Um, and in so doing, I introduced a certain um, structure to my comments that will, will link in with a, um, a process we go through often and think about model formulation um, for, uh, for, for building agent-based models. Um, those features involved uh, thinking about population, one or more populations of agents characterized by diversity and, char and static characteristics we call parameters and states, the evolving situation of an agent. Talking about the actions that can change that state based on the current state. It is a dynamic system. So what happens in the next little bit depends on a current situation. We talked about rules that govern under what conditions and how much those actions fire. Talked about putting those agents in environments that capture context, things like spatial and geographic environments, network environments. And we talked about placing them in a timeline with either discrete time steps where the model advances kind of in lockstep with all agents updating at a given time and then updating again for the next time step. And again, all in lockstep, all, all together at once atomically. Um, but we also talked about a model of continuous time. And that's over some time horizon that we're considering. And there are one or two other characteristics that I mentioned, but those were some aspects of agent-based uh, agent modeling that I put on the table, things that are, are prominent characteristics. I chose that material in part because we only had half, about half an hour left to cover it and it needed to be covered. But in some ways, um, what I really wanted to do um, in that class was instead to to expose you to some um, direct experience with database models, to give you a, um, a set of particulars, concrete specifics that you could use as points of reference as we get into some fa fairly conceptual topics. I've traditionally kicked this course off, the substantive part of the course off, with a motivation for agent-based modeling. And I also considered that for today, but I decided it would be much more effective if we could look at some agent-based models, experience some interaction with them and talk about something about what we observe in those models. Um, and that will at once provide you know, some uh, illustration of these general concepts that motivate agent-based modeling and the pieces that we put together to define an agent-based model. So I want to go through that exercise with you today. And I, I wanted to go through it building on that request I had from the first lecture to wit of uh, downloading, installing any logic PLE. So if you haven't done that, you can watch me undertake these interactions myself, but hopefully any will have any logic PLE and we'll be able to able to explore some interactions uh, alongside me simultaneously with me. Okay. Um, so um, to that end, I placed some models up here um, on the uh, the course site um, for us to explore together. There won't be sufficient time to explore all of them, but um, there will be uh, a chance for those interested in going further to try their hands with, with some we don't get to. The first of them that I want to explore, in, in some sense from a domain perspective, from, from the perspective of someone coming here from health background, is the least interesting in terms of its texture. But in some ways, it's the most interesting in terms of illustrating some, some essential principles of agent-based modeling in as simple a setting as possible. 
And that's this SIR agent based uh, for PLE. Um, it's uh, it's the first of the models, and I'll have to share my screen here so that those online can see to what I'm pointing. Um, so there we go. Um, so uh, it's it's this one here, and I've I've sort of made it small so that uh, it could fit into this uh, into this um, one page. But it's down here. So it's on the course site. If you log into the Canvas site for this course, hey, come on, um, it uh, it should be visible to you. And I'm not quite sure why this isn't uh, properly scrolling down, but uh, you can see it there. SIR agent based for PLE. Okay. So um, I'd like so I'd like those who have any logic PLE to download this. Okay. And I, won't, I certainly won't pursue this uh, at this pace um, throughout the course. I'll expect some emerging facility with this. But um, for the moment, I will download it with you and, and open it up with you. So this uh, SIR agent base for PLE on Canvas. And we are going to download this here. And uh, it it's... Place this in the downloads folder, and I'll say show all downloads, and uh, we should be able to go find it on the computer here. Um, you can't see the downloads window, but there we go. We're going to open this model in any logic, okay? Um, and to that end, uh, I'd like those here to to open up any logic. Um, now, if you've never uh, opened up any logic before, or um, your experience may be uh, a little bit different um, from my own, but um, uh, if you're opening it for the first time, often it, it lands you in this first screen, okay? Um, which provides you resources for getting started, tutorials, et cetera. And, um, you know, if, if you're new to the platform, some of these things may be of, of interest, um, but our quarry is different today. We're gonna to be opening up that particular model we already downloaded and walk through some exercises with it. Okay, um, so this, this screen is presented in what's known as an interactive development environment here. Um, and uh, up on the upper right, there, there should be uh, a small area to minimize the screen. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, having so minimized uh, the screen with, with that button up there, um, we should be able to then, um, so, so I press the button up in that area to minimize it. Uh, we should be able to load in this model. So I'm going to do so here uh, at the cost of, of, of turning my back to the online folks. I'm going to go to downloads and grab this, this model up here. Okay. Um, so, so this model is uh, what would be called in the parlance of, uh, of dynamic modeling and agent-based modeling, in particular, a stylized model or a model for theory building. We'll use that term uh, soon enough as well. It's not meant to depict a particular situation. This is not a model of, you know, COVID here in Saskatoon. It's not a model of West Nile virus in, you know, the north of Ontario or 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 of Manitoba. It's it, far from that. It's um, uh, it's a model that's designed to see how just a few elements, um, a few simple assumptions can give rise to behavior that um, is uh, thought provoking and sometimes surprising. Okay. Um, so uh, I've loaded that model in again with file open and, uh, and loading the model in here. And uh, having so done that uh, here on the left-hand panel, you should be able to see some aspects of model structure. Um, so over in this projects area, there's some illustrations of model structure. This course is not 
it is a is a course that goes conceptually deep in ancient based modeling. It's not contingent on on any logic, but I want to orient you with respect to some features that this points to for ancient based modeling in general. This model is composed of pieces that jointly illustrate a certain theory. They embody a certain theory. So uh, over here, if you were to explore double click on person, for example, um, I've got to tame this mouse. Um, here we go. Uh, you'll find, so if we double click on person, a window opens, and it depicts sort of a theory of personhood, a theory of personness, uh, as far as the model is concerned. And it's a singularly simple, that is stylized uh, theory. So we have uh, a given person situation as being depicted uh, with respect to being encompassed by just one concern. In this case, infectious, their situation with respect to infectious disease, their natural history of, of infection. Proceeding between a susceptible and infectious and a recovered state here, okay? Um, and uh, those three states jointly characterize the entire set of possibilities uh, for a person within this model. A given person's situation at any one time, their state is characterized by being in exactly one of these states. So they're either susceptible, they're infectious, or they're recovered. They're mutually exclusive, they're collectively exhausted. Um, now there's another characteristic for the person, which is their color. We're not gonna get into it, but it, it's, it's the color with which they're, they're depicted. It's more for visualization here. And finally, um, as we'll see, they're gonna have a location. And I'm not gonna show you all the ins and outs of it, but this person is going to be distinguished by having a position, um, a position within some overall environment. So these are characteristics of a person. And then I told you from this very floor last time that Asian-based modeling is characterized by one or more populations which are in which there are individually depicted actors um, that act in some sense autonomously. Um, so you might expect this is a theory of personhood for this model. And each such person is likely in a population. And if you go to Maine here, uh, again, through this window on the left uh, that depicts model structure, and we double click on Maine, um, you'll find uh, some, some particulars here. But one of the things, and I'm going to scroll over here, um, is going to be a population of people, okay? Um, so this is a population of agents. You can kind of see the uh, the label there. It's a it's a population of agents as given by account given by this thing called parameter, the total population that specifies an assumption, and, and uh, in this case, it's specified by the scenarios. So so this is a model. It depicts a theory of personhood. It, that whereby each person is evolving over time, they have some characteristics that are static, their 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 location, um, and uh, they're situated in an environment. Uh, many of those pieces, in short, that we talked about last time, as as you know, being characteristic of ancient based models. Um, but an age-based model um, depicted these things, um, not merely as a model, not merely to sort of help communicate them and put them out there clearly in the light of day so people could understand our assumptions and, and help us refine them, but in order to understand their logical consequences. Their consequences for behavior over time, and over space and over other uh, characteristics depicted. We're interested in, with this theory, specifying it at a precise enough, enough level to the point where we can simulate its consequences, its logical consequences in terms of its behavior that it exhibits. 
So let's go explore that behavior. I'm going to go up to the upper left there in the projects window. And one of the components you'll find there within this model is a scenario. And that scenario involved running this model with a certain set of assumptions as communicated by indeed parameters, uh, which if you, if you go over there to the right, you can find it's pausing an average illness duration of 10 days, for example, a contact rate of one per day. Maybe this is depicting sexually, infect, sexually transmitted infection or something. Um, so this is a scenario. Simulation is a scenario. It sets this model up with certain particular assumptions within this theory in a way that will allow us to say what, you know, what if, go figure. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to right click on simulation here. This is just one way to do it, but we'll right click on simulation and we're going to choose run down at the bottom. Uh, so here we go. And if we, if we do that, up will come a window and uh, I'm going to go place it on this other, other screen. Up comes this window. Now, this model is actually not yet running. It's set up to run this particular with these particular set of assumptions specified by the scenario. Um, but you'll see it here um, set up with poise to run, allowing us to to specify like how fast do we want it to run and and providing us with some additional choices. Do we want it to run all at once or, or little bit by little bit? We're going to go and press the button that says run the model and switch to main view. What we're going to see here is a, a screen where we're, we're going to have a set of individuals uh, illustrated. And if we go, we can actually go um, move around the screen. In my case, something unusual has happened on the lower right of this screen. Um, for, for others of you running it, this may be occurring somewhere else on the screen. Um, but what we see taking place here is a spread of infection. It's a spread of infection from one individual to another. We depicted in that theory of personhood a, a progression of infection. And uh, that progression was between states susceptible, infected, and recovered. And one thing I would have done well to emphasize within that was that within the infective state here, um, people could transmit infection to random neighbors, okay? To neighbors who were randomly chosen. And if that, if that, tempted transmission fell on someone who was susceptible, they too would get infected. That's uh, what this um, transition here depicted. And what we're seeing is the logical consequence of that within the environment. So we're seeing there was an initial seed for the infection. And from that, there's a spread over time. Now, what you see here has a certain regularity to it. There's an orderliness to it. Um, uh, I would say, I would note that susceptibles here are yellow, red is infective, and, uh, and gray is recovered. Can anyone describe what, what, is, what do you think is taking place here? Why do we see this kind of circle or semicircle here um, playing out, and why is it expanding over time. Does anyone want to offer an interpretation of that? By the way, I'm uh, adjusting these things down here. I can I can run it and pause it. Does anyone want to offer an interpretation? What's going on here? Anyone online, remotely, or, or locally? There's a lot of people recovering. Yeah, there's a lot of people recovering. And they're recovering. Who is it that's recovering? People who are already infected. So people start susceptible, they become infected if under what conditions do they become infected? If they are like, why aren't the people way over here in the upper left getting infected on my screen? Because they need to be. That's a total population. Yeah. 
Okay, so there's a total population. Who is it amongst them that's getting infected? Who is it amongst who are in contact with, who are in contact with the infectives? That's right. Now, uh, why is it forming this sort of circle? Did, somewhere in this, did we specify a circle? I mean, in our depiction here um, in the model, was, was there some place we, we said that there's a circle which is expanding over time? Sorry? Yeah, these are neighbors. So, so what's happening is there's an obvious structure here. It's kind of a circle, right? I mean, roughly speaking, it's a circle. Um, and uh, I'm going to continue to run it. You'll see that circle expanding outwards at a certain speed. But the existence of this sort of semicircular uh, sort of uh, characteristic of the space now and how quickly it expands out, it, it really isn't something we can track down to any one statement in the model. It emerges from the model. It emerges from a set of interacting characteristics in the model. Um, how quickly that, that moves out and the, the very shape of it is a reflection of many characteristics of the model. Is it a reflection, for example, of the contact rate? Yes. How quickly they send others messages. Is it a depicted depiction of the fact that contact is local? Absolutely, in some notable way. Is it a depiction of how long they spend infected before recovering? Yes. Um, it's, it's a characteristic that, that emerges from all of those. It's a characteristic of the structure of the space, that people are connected with neighbors, north, south, east, west, northeast, southwest, northeast, and, and, and southeast. So it's a characteristic of many of these things. And it gives rise to this behavior that isn't pre-programmed in any sense. It's, it's kind of what we call an emergent feature of uh, that results from running this model. Um, and uh, as such, um, uh, we, you know, we sometimes learn things that we didn't anticipate from these simulations. I'd like to run some variants of these simulations to show um, some of the some of the relationships between model assumptions on the one hand and these results on the other. So to do that, I'm going to stop this simulation. I can do it either with this low button way up there or with this button here. I'll do it here and we'll actually close this window and we'll run one of these other simulations. So I'm going to say, first let's run slow recovery. So this has the exact same model with different particular assumptions about how quickly people recover from infection. Instead of being 10 days, it's now 50 days. How do you think, what, what do you think will result from this? How will it look compared to what we just saw? Anyone? A lot less gray. Uh, a lot less, uh, gray. a lot le less what? Gray. Um, uh, a lot less rin. Um, gray. gray. Uh, um, Okay, a lot less red. Gray. Oh, gray. Yes, less gray. That's right. Sorry. <laughs> Apologies. Uh, um, so uh, that's exactly right. Um, so uh, it's uh, we're going to have much less much less gray. Lots of red. I'm hearing in the chat window. That's exactly right. So let's let's go explore this uh, if we could. Um, so we're going to try running this. Now, exactly how much, exactly what will it look like? Well, this is kind of a hard thing for us to think through, right? Um, it, it requires putting together many pieces because after all, um, uh, whether it spreads more quickly is not so clear because uh, maybe by the time someone's been affected for a while, they're not near any, any uh, susceptibles anymore. So we just saw that there. I'm going to, we ran that as quickly as possible. That's this button down here. I'm going to turn that off and, and do it again so that um, you can see it spread uh, 
again from uh, another point and a little bit more slowly. But you see very much what was said, less gray, more red. Does it, does it spread quicker? Does it spread a lot quicker? Well, we'd have to do some timing, right? It's, it's not so clear. There's a case to be made it does because people are infected for longer, so they'll infect more people over the course of their illness, surely. But maybe not because the people who've been infected for a long time might be in the interior, right? And they might not be next to a susceptible anymore. All the susceptibles around them might've already gotten infected. So maybe it won't spread that much quicker, right? Um, uh, we can perform experiments with this to, to identify um, uh, whether or not indeed this characteristic manifests in a way that speeds up the spread, for example, um, or that changes um, you know, the fundamental dynamics in terms of its, uh, the, the number infected over time. Um, now, if we scroll up, we'll also see some other characteristics that are very much part of, of agent-based modeling, um, uh, agent-based modeling practice and, uh, and indeed uh, opportunities for insight. So what we see below was a depiction where each agent was, was characterized. What we see above are, are summary statistics that total up across the population the number of individuals in different states, the count that are susceptible, that's the purple there, the count that are infectious or count that are recovered. And uh, what you'll see is, is a summary of that space at any one time. And of course, by speeding this up down here um, at the bottom, uh, we can speed up um, that progression. And what you'll see is some characteristic patterns coming out of there. The number of infectious is low initially, it rises uh, and it reaches some um, peak points and then it declines, for example. The number of susceptible starts very high, but ends up coming down and essentially going to zero. The number of recovered starts at zero and, and rises up. These are characteristic patterns. And you know, if we ran the model um, uh, with several times over, what we'll see is something similar, but um, different in its particulars. So we'll run it again here, and uh, I will speed this up here uh, a number of times, and we'll go up up here, and there we go. Um, so now we see a slightly different uh, characteristic. So here, what's, what's happened? Can anyone say? Why do we have like a, a, a dual peak here instead of just one peak? It's different in its particulars, but it's a matter of stochastics. This model is something uh, of a, of a um, stochastic process. So over time, if we go to person, uh, to whom they spread the infection is a random process. How quickly they recover is a uh, random matter. It's a certain rate, it occurs with certain probability or probability densities, a certain hazard rate over time. So this model, has some regularities to it. Each time we run it, there will be some, some broad orderliness to it, but it will differ in its, its particulars because it is stochastic as are most agent-based models, not invariably, not every single time, but um, most such models uh, indeed uh, exhibit stochastics is a prominent feature in part because when we're characterizing things at an individual level, behavior, um, chance events like transmission, transmission of ideas or norms, these are, these are, these have uncertainties associated with them. There's randomness associated with them. So here we we see a somewhat different profile over time. Broadly similar, susceptible starts high and goes very low. 
recovered starts low and goes very high. Infectious goes up and comes down, but different in, in, in its particulars, different in its specifics. These models tend to be stochastic. Um, but let's go, let's go explore some other aspects. We've we've seen how how uh, just changing our assumptions about parameters can lead to differences in the appearance. We'll run it with fast recovery, and I'll ask you, what happens if we have people recover in just two days instead of 10 days or instead of 50 days? What do you think will happen then? Anyone? Test your intuitions. Not much red. Not much red, okay. Others? Do you think we'll see more gray before we saw less gray? Do you think we'll see more gray now? More gray, more recovered people, okay? Um, do you think it will change the, sp the speed of spread? How quickly it spreads out? How quickly that waveform propagates outwards? Maybe? Depending on the contact rate. Depending on the contact rate, right. So if I told you the contract rate is one per day, do you think it will spread that will affect that? So on average, one person they infect per day. Um, do you think keeping them infected for only for only two time steps before they recover might affect how quickly it spreads? Maybe, but this is what computers are really good at, right? They're good at, at doing these very simple calculation very, very, very quickly. That's what computers excel at. Uh, so let's let's use the computer for for the purposes for which it's really, really well suited. So we're gonna run it here. Oh, okay, I ran it as quickly as possible. And now we see something interesting, but I ran it too quickly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I turned it off of this virtual time mode where it runs as quickly as possible. And I'm going to run it slow here, okay? Um, so here we go. And what do you see as going on here? Anyone? Does it look similar or different to before? And how is it different? Yeah, okay, so, so they're being infected and quickly they get recovered. Do, do you see that characteristic circular wave front? No, no not so much, yeah. right? What else is different? It started from the middle. Okay, um, wh where it starts, I'll tell you, is, is random, but but there's something else that looks different here. And also some are not being infected. Some are not being infected. You have these islands of, who are these yellow? There are, Susceptibles. They're susceptibles that have been left over, right? <laughs> like that, that survive. They're like pieces of wood that never got burnt, right? Yeah. So this is quite different. And maybe we could have gotten some elements of this in our head, but, but you know, it's much easier to tell the computer, look, go run this and, and what emerges. And what we see here is an emergent pattern. Again, we, we, it's not like we told it put islands in the middle here and scatter them around and and you know just have uh, just have this very rough edges and so on. Those high level features were not things we pre-programmed in. They weren't told to the model produce this. Instead, this is what was generated by the model's assumptions. And what what you see here is. A reflection for sure of a shorter of a shorter uh, time people remain infected but it's also a reflection of how people transmit the infection to nearby people and and you know um the fact that when someone gets uh, exposed they definitely get infected etc um all those things are tied up here the shape of who they who can they transmit it to who, who are the neighbors to which they can spread the infection. It would look quite different if they could spread them to people, you know, 10 steps away, for example. Um, but these are illustrations of the, the centrality of this notion of emergence. We have an emergent property here, the spotty space that, that was generated by the system without being pre-programmed into it. And Josh Epstein, 
um, uh, a prominent pioneer of agent-based modeling and health, formerly at Johns Hopkins University and now at NYU, you know, um, uh, has written on the generativist perspective in science, this idea that you don't really understand a phenomenon until you can generate it without presupposing it. In other words, you can give rise to it without in some sense hard coding it into your assumptions. Um, that's when you really understand something. And you know these are features we've saw it, those semicircles, the, the spreading ring, these these islands of infection that are emergent features. And the truth is there's tremendous amount of structure around us in the world that is, indicative of this sort of uh, emergence. Another example would be traffic jams, right? I, I argued this last time that, um, uh, that we can know all the world uh, about the cars and axle types and engine types and you know the shape of the curb or the width of a road, but, but know very little about traffic jams and how they form and uh, uh, how to how to improve them etc um traffic jams are a higher level emergent property that come from many many cars interacting with the shape of the road and the weather conditions and the visibility and the and the, the road surface and the speed limit and all those sort of factors those give rise to they generate traffic jams um a traffic jam cannot be reduced to just the tire types of the cars or the engine types of the cars or the number of lanes, et cetera. So, you know, these sort of emergent properties are all around us. And to understand these emergent properties requires something, a different type of model than we use in, in trad traditional reductive science. It means going beyond just taking things apart into their pieces. It requires models that can generate behavior over time. And that's what dynamic models are, and that's what agent-based models are. Uh, so we've seen some features, but I, I want to get at one other piece of agent-based modeling. Um, so uh, actually, two other pieces. So one thing is, um, I want to highlight the fact that one of the biggest motivations for these sorts of models are the fact that we not only want to understand phenomena in many cases in the world, we want to improve the situation in the world. We want to bend the curve. We want to, we want to turn things for the better. Um, this is certainly true with infectious diseases, but it's true with many types of health conditions, many types of social conditions, and it's true in general with many types of, of phenomena, of emergent phenomena. We build these models so that we can understand those phenomena, but we, so we can better manage, prevent, control them as well. And um, I'd like to, to take a look at this example through that lens. So let's go back to that kind of baseline simulation. The simulation we used is our kind of default, the first one here. And I'd like to run it. Okay. Um, and I'll run it at normal speed. So that's this uh, X1 here. So that's just, when I say normal speed, I mean, it's it's sort of the, the default reference speed. And uh, just so that it's more visible, I'm going to, to enlarge this, and we'll see the infection spreading down here. Um, I'm going to go up here, uh, and I will say we're going to perform uh, a random immunization. We're going to we're going to have a hundred people here that we're going to randomly immunize across the population. Do you think that will help? Do you think it will help if I, if I randomly immunize those people, make them immune to infection? I can do it a couple of times, right? Um, I'll do it, I'll press this button many times. You see more and more of these 
ones that are being put down here in gray. What does gray mean again? Can anyone say? Yeah, recovered. So this is like, we're making them immune to infection because we're placing them in a state where they can't get uh, recovered or where they can't get infected again. Does that help? Specific yeah. yeah, so who does it help? Yeah. Who, who is it helping here mostly? The specific ones who got vaccinated. Yeah. Um, uh, does it help others a uh, tiny bit? Well, maybe. Um, maybe it will slow the spread, but, <laughs> you know, this is a pretty inevitable process here. And so others are going to get infected. Okay, now let's, uh, let's try something different. We're going to stop this. So what we're doing is intervening now. We're going beyond just observing, right? And observing what's the consequence of, if we make this assumption with this model structure, what are the logical consequences of that? Um, uh, so, so Vanessa says, we'll help those immunize and those close to them, but it seems it doesn't slow down transmission a lot. Excellent, yeah, darn exactly right, Vanessa. So let's, let's go back and I wanna start this again from the start. Um, so I, I press the stop button and, and start it again. Here we go. And what we're going to do now is an outbreak response immunization. Here we're going to we're going to respond. We're going to immunize people around the borders. I'm going to do it again. Okay. Do you see what's going on here? I'm immunizing people next to those who are who are infected. And you know we could do it a few more times here, and you'll see something rather different. Does anyone notice a difference here? What's happened? Anyone? So I did outbreak response immunization a number of times, and what what's happened? Contained I've contained it. I've I've put in place, as it were. Uh, uh, cordon sanitaire. Um, I put in place a, uh, a a sort of ring around this that that contains it by immunizing people preferentially around the front of the infection. Right. I've I've, I've it's almost as if per Saleh's comment, I've I've put like water around the ring of where you know the wildfire is spreading. Right. Um, to prevent it from spreading. I put, you can imagine forest fire and I put, I put water or fire retardant all around it so it can't spread effectively, right? That's, that's what's going on. Um, now, mind you, um, you know, how many we put down may be limited. If we're limited to a hundred, we may need to intervene what? If we're limited to to this perform outbreak response immunization. I'll tell you, if we were to look at how that's implemented, and probably later in this course, we will. Um, there's some neat code behind it, I will say. Um, if you were to do that, um, and, but you're limited to 100, uh, to immunizing 100 people at a time, what does that put a premium on? Intervening what? Anyone? Location? Uh, yeah, so intervening in sensible locations and does it matter whether you intervene early versus late? Like, could could you be just as effective doing that, you know, after delaying? So, so let's suppose I run it. Let's suppose I were to run it now. Here we go. Boom. Um, I were to run it, start running it, and I were to undertake that initially. That is is now. Um, uh, here we go. Versus if I were to do it, I'll, I'll spread the speed this up versus if I were to do it now, which do you think would be more effective? If I only have 100 people I can vaccinate at a time, which do you think would be effective? Interve do you think it'll make any difference whether I do it early versus later? Proactive. Yeah, proactively doing it early when it's a smaller ring, a smaller set there, Will be a lot more effective. We went for, might be able to block if it's just ten people. Might be able to entirely, you know, enclose them, encase them, encapsulate them with 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 uh, people who are recovered, right, and with people who are immunized. 
Um, whereas if we try to do it now, we've got this huge front over which to do it. And, you know, we're not going to be that effective at sort of blocking it, um, uh, block it everywhere. In fact, we could barely see it. I said perform outbreak response immunization, and you can you can barely barely see the effects here. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you know we often use these models, these these agent based models, to reason about not just why we see behavior, but how to improve that behavior, how to how to make it less deleterious, how to bend the curve, how to head off a problem, how to prevent, how to control uh, an adverse situation, or how to manage a situation um, that we, we have to live with, but we want to be able to manage it more skillfully so it doesn't, it causes less harm. So models like this are useful for reasoning about ways to intervene on the world. They consist of this theory of the world, in this case, a person, you know, interacting with their environment and others in their environment. Um, and by running them, we can reason about the behavior of the system over time. But I do want to leave you with, uh, with an additional component here, which is really important because when we specify these models, and this is kind of harking back to this idea of of using these as tools to understand the logical consequences of our assumptions. If we look back at person here, um, we'll find that while we've been specifying in these types of scenarios, particular quantitative assumptions about, about, about model, model assumptions, um, uh, the model, the, the sort of um, speed with which certain processes take place, for example, how quickly you recover from infection, for fast recovery, it was in two days, for the baseline, it was 10 days, for slow recovery, it was 50 days. Um, there's another feature of assumptions about the model that are even more profound, and those have to do with model structure. And when I'm saying model structure here, I'm referring to the relationships characterized amongst other things in this diagram. You'll notice that this diagram um, isn't using numbers to define, you know, where the arrows are attached or what have you, but it's every bit as important and I would argue more important even than the particulars of those numbers we've looked at. What this is describing is the structure of the process of of infection. Um, it's characterizing what is possible after what, what's the sequence or what's the, the, what are the possible sequences, for example, someone could go through here with respect to infection. And there's a lot there that's being packed into this diagram. Um, there's a lot of expertise that might get packed into this diagram that you might elicit from experts in this area. It's, it's not in the form of a number, a quantitative assumption about, you know, the size of, of a particular number. Um, uh, some types of information are like that, but what we see here is actually uh, different than that. It has to do with the connectivity and sort of what is possible. What are the, what's the structure of the process? What are the steps it can go through and which are distinguished from which, et cetera. And these include things about, for example, interactions, um, contacts between agents, uh, the fact that, for example, infection is only sent to a neighbor in space, um, not to any old person across the entire space. These are assumptions which really make a big difference for, for model behavior. And within dynamic modeling more generally, um, we talk about how structure determines behavior. The structure we have here determines the behavior um, that we see over time, but also as we'll see over space. Um, we'll see it um, manifest spatially. In fact, that's what we've been looking at. We've been seeing emergent patterns over time. That was that growth of those curves, but also over space, those rings, those islands, et cetera. 
So let's go take a look at this. Um, uh, I want to modify this uh, assumption with a simple alternative theory. Uh, it'll be a tweak to our theory as it were. So I'd like to allow um, for a situation where someone's immunity, that is them being in this recovered state wanes over time. So it decreases over time. They lose immunity. Uh, they can lose immunity over time. How might, I, how might I characterize that in a diagram like this? If someone who is recovered could get susceptible again, what do you think I could add to this diagram to capture that fact? Uh, arrow from over to yeah, an arrow from recovered to susceptible. So let's go. Let's go do that. So here, this is going to be your first modification of a model on the structure of a model. I'm going to go over to the left hand side, and I'm going to go to the palette, and I'm going to go down to this thing that looks like Da Vinci's measure of man, um, measure of a person. There we go. Um, on the left-hand side, under the palette agent, it's called, okay? And if you do that, what you'll see is that there's this area called state chart there, okay? Um, and one of the items there is something called a transition, right? Um, it's uh, down here, okay? So I'd like to drag this out and I connected it. So I dragged it in and I connected it so it comes from recovered and it goes to susceptible, boom, okay? And I'm going to, because uh, it troubles me to see it crossing over another state, I'm going to double click on it. And this is hard with my current configuration, but I'm gonna double click on it and, and add a little handle that I can then drag. And you can add as many handles as you want. Okay. Um, but I'm going to drag it just so it's obvious that they go from recovered to susceptible um, and no one's confused that they somehow become infectious. Okay. So here we're going to have someone go from recovered to susceptible. But when we specify that, we need to, we need to uh, specify some particular amount of time it takes for them to go, okay? Um, and what we're going to do over here is to add in um, a, in the timeout, uh, excuse me, and the, the assumptions about this, we're going to add some particulars. Now, I want to highlight, in terms of my last lecture, what I've just done, what this state chart depicts is the set of possible states the actions that can change the state, those are those transitions. And again, using the parlance of, that I introduced last time, the rules by which those actions fire. This, this arrow we just added is characterizing an action, recovery from susceptible, recovered to susceptible, waning of immunity. But what we're gonna specify now by saying triggered by rate is a rule that governs under what conditions that occurs. And I'm going to make the rate here um, uh, one, here we are, um, 1.0 divided by 150.0, okay, um, per day, per day, okay? Um, so make sure you use the, the um, Plotting point numbers, sir. Okay. Um, and um, that will indicate that on average, this is a hazard rate. On average, it turns out statistically, on average, they will spend 150 days in the recovered state before going on to susceptible. Some will leave before that, some will leave later. Um, but um, the rate, the lambda, for those familiar with common stochastic processes parlance uh, here is, is uh, 150, uh, or sorry, one divided by 150, yeah. Um, the mean time in that state is 150 days. Okay, what do you think the consequences of this would be if we allow people to 
recover, um, uh, excuse me, to, to have their immunity wane, to go from recovered to susceptible. What do you think the consequences will be? Anyone? Sort of qualitatively, does anyone want to put forward a, a thought? Okay, within a certain range of a parameter, um, uh, infection will not end, red spots in the gray zone. Within a certain range of the parameter, there might be waves of infection. Great, great. Okay, lots of good ideas. Let's have, let's let the computer go figure with this, right? And it's going to take this theory, this elaborated theory, which we've handed it, and it's going to play out its logical consequences over time and, and over space, right? And how it spreads out over, over space. It's going to yield to emergent behavior that's hard for us to, to think through in our head. I argued last time that it was, you know, they've done experiments with even the most quantitative, you know, PhDs in, in science, technology, engineering, and math. And, and they tend to be very poor at thinking these things through in their head. It's much easier to have a computer sort of logically play out the consequences. And that's what simulation modeling is about having it logically play out the consequence. Okay, so let's let's do that. Let's go back to projects here and have it have it uh, play out the consequences. So we're going to go to to uh, there the the default simulation and we'll drag this up and there's our infection and it's playing out. So far, we don't see a lot of differences, but what's going on here? Can anyone say what's what's happening? Okay, so some of the recovered are again getting susceptible. That's right. That's right. Now, do you do you see any new waves of infection? Yeah. Okay, there are some, right? Um, uh, okay. They recovered, they're again getting susceptible, and there's some that might have been susceptible uh, three times, right? Uh, and the same thing over and over again. Okay, so, so now the dynamic has radically changed. We've gone from a sort of single outbreak which rises, you know, crests, comes down and disappears to something where the infection is endemic is, is the, the health science term, or it stays present, it keeps on circulating. It can spread even two and a half years after its original introduction, right? Um, and so here we're seeing multiple waves of infection spreading, right? Um, uh, and that is just keeping this cycle going. People are are perhaps at any one time, most people look susceptible. We could check our impression there, but let's go, ah, now look at the, the dynamics. This, the, the emergent behavior as measured by these aggregate measures is also profoundly different, right? Um, what do you see different here than we saw before? Does anyone remember when we first looked, what did this look like for infectious? With like when we looked before, before adding that transition, what did it look like? It was more like normal distribution. Yeah, it went up and came down, right? Sometimes it was a little bit double peak, but but yeah. basically went up and down. What does it look like now? Like waves. Waves, waves, cyclic, right? Um, not totally periodic, but but cyclic because not totally periodic because there are stochastics, right? Um. But we see something profoundly different. Now, um, are the oscillations decaying? Well, that's a very good question. Um, they do have a certain appearance of, of uh, changing a little bit, but we actually cut off the, the time here. I'll, I'll show you where if anyone would like to go investigate that. Um, you go to simulation here. Um, you could create a new version of this, right click on this and say copy and put it in here and say paste. Oops, oh, oh no, 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 no. What did I just do? Um, sorry, I'm in a sort of very awkward 
uh, ergonomics your paste. And I could say, you know, perpetual simulation, right? Uh, perpetual, uh, perpetual per, okay. Um, this is really, really for the birds, uh, perpetual simulation. Okay. Um, and really this should be called baseline. And then model time down there. Remember I told you last time from this very floor that simulation models like this um, have a time horizon associated with it. Well, here we specify the time horizon. Right now it says stop, it's specified time, but I'm going to make it never stop. Never stop, here we go, uh, never. Um, so if we wanna run it, oh, we, we might be able to, to go see it, okay. Um, yeah, it says, okay, I won't be able to open it. Okay, fine. Um, and, oh. Did you got some slashes in the... In the did I get a slash? Oh, no, where's it? Oh, God. Um, okay, uh, there we go. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's that's good. Okay, um, so now we, we can run it here, and uh, we'll... Great. Okay, and, and we could speed it up and uh, run it far faster. Maybe we'll run it, for example, uh, at, at you know, 50 times faster. Uh, things move forward and, and empires rise and fall and, and you know, the, the waves uh, continue here. Um, and, and they're going going out, but now we see more pronounced waves for a while, right? Uh, so it doesn't seem that it's approaching an equilibrium state as you might, might think it would. It seems to go through these periods where the waves are more pronounced and then some where they are a little bit less, uh, less big. Um, but it doesn't seem that it's approaching equilibrium, but those are interesting uh, questions. Um, so I appreciate that. Um, let's, let's go try this now with, and let me, okay. Um, I'm going to try this with fast recovery. Okay, so now we have this reinfection or sorry, this waning of infection going on, which can lead to a person getting reinfected. Um, what do you think the consequences will be if you're assuming a fast recovery? Anyone? Oh, okay. Um, I ran that at, as fast as possible and it looked like it went to this situation where we had lots of people still Still affected. Okay. Um, okay. This time it didn't even look like it. It took off at all. Why would that be? Anyone? Why, why might it be that it doesn't take off at all? No time to spread. If people are recovering quickly. Yeah, people are recovering quick enough that maybe sometimes it doesn't even get established. Right. Um, uh, here it's getting established uh, and it will spread. Um, it looks like it's sort of caught. Um, it's a little bit like lighting a fire. If any of you have, have, have lit a fire, sometimes the wind happens to blow it out and it doesn't catch and it, it'll die out. And sometimes it, it does catch and will persist. And um, in this particular scenario is very, susceptible to it dying out, um, dying out altogether. We may have people becoming susceptible again, but if the infection has died out before then, you know, um, it doesn't matter. They won't be infected by anything. Um, and it will reach a disease-free equilibrium after, after some, some time here, just as to when it will die out is a matter of chance. How about a slow recovery? What do you think this will lead to? Anyone? We have slow recovery. So here we still have loss of immunity, but we have slow recovery. That means people are infected for longer. Sorry? So what's going on here? 
everyone gets immediately infected. Okay, so they get immediately infected as soon as they they uh, lose their immunity, and it just persists at very high levels of of infection. Right. Um, okay, so you know, yeah, lots of sort of bubbling. It's a bubbling cauldron of infection with very high prevalence, but some people, of course, always always recovered. And what you see is actually here a little bit more, you know, it's it's uh, it's actually quite stable, right? In terms of the details of who's who's infected, you know, who's not at any one time will vary, but the count is pretty similar. The count of susceptibles is pretty similar. The count of of recovered is pretty similar, despite the stochastic. Um, so, uh, and all these assumed a single introduction. Yeah, absolutely. And it's easy to, to relax that assumption and have more than one introduction or sometimes have zero or, or what have you. Um, so this is, this is a model that is very, that is extremely stylized. It's, it's a model for thinking through the consequences of, of uh, some simple assumptions. Um, it's a model where it's descriptively simple. What I mean by that is it doesn't take a lot to describe what's going on. Basically, people go through three states, susceptible if they're infected, they become infectious, if, and uh, after a while they become recovered. And you know, here optionally, they go back to being susceptible again. Um, while infectious, they can spread to neighbors in a group. Quite, quite simple in its components. This is not complicated, but it is complex in a, in a sense of dynamic complexity. It gives rise to emergent patterns that can be surprised, can be sometimes um, uh, counterintuitive. Um, it gives rise to patterns that that cannot be entirely thought through ahead of time. Uh, and as such, um, it certainly qualifies as a complex system. That's different from a complicated system. A complicated system, for example, might have lots and lots of, of, of details and, 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 and individual parts, but maybe it gives rise to behavior that is not terribly surprising. It's kind of a sum or average of what we see across the entire system. This is different. This is something that gives rise to patterns that in, were in no way pre-programmed into it. Whether it was those islands of infection or the, the ring of infection that was spreading outwards, so the, 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 the thickness of that ring or the, the features of cycles, those weren't pre-programmed into this. Those emerged from it. So we can have very, very descriptively simple models that give rise to great complexity, these sort of um, complex higher level structures, this higher level order that you know, can't be reduced to any one piece. And we've seen how using that, we could use that as a, as a measure for understanding patterns and for asking what if we were to intervene in different ways? What if we were to try to change the situation? How much would it help or hurt, for example? How much would it change those dynamics? Uh, we've also seen that these models are composed of many pieces. Um, so within, within these models, we have characteristics uh, that are static, things like color. We have aspects uh, in location and in, in model, excuse me, color was not, but location was static. Here, um, susceptible, infected, recovered, or state, or different possible states. And uh, we, we delineate for each agent in, this, in a broader one or more populations, their static characteristics or parameters, their possible states they can be in, and actions that can change the state as illustrated by these, by these transitions. And the rules under which those actions can be fired. Uh, those of you interested in playing around more, um, and I might even 
have a little uh, take home exercise from this. You may want, may find it interesting to examine what, how the behavior differs if you change this from a rate transition to a timeout transition with the same average time spent infectious, excuse me, spent before waning of immunity, spent in the recovered state, same 150 days on average, but with that waning of immunity occurring exactly after 150 days. Um, we've also seen that models like this, uh, beyond depicting these agents, who, which evolve, whose states evolve and have characteristics that are fixed, um, and, and that differ from each other, that's heterogeneity, they also can interact with each other. And this, um, uh, this mode of interaction here was enabled through this contact transition that allowed agents to interact in the environment. And that made all the difference in terms of behavior. They were placed in that overall environment and that allowed for those interactions. And then finally, for each of these, there was a model time frame specified or time horizon where we said run this for over a certain time horizon. In this case, it was in continuous time, meaning whenever agents got infected or recovered, we just handled it at that natural time. We didn't force them into a single lockstep that they all can only update at the same time yeah, going, going forward um, all in, in kind of in unison. So these are some major features of agent-based modeling. Um, and uh, we'll likely be talking about some of the big motivations, um, why these sort of features are so important, why understanding of emergence is so important, why understanding the impacts of interventions are so important, why understanding patterns that we see in the world are so important uh, for our understanding of the world and in public health, how to, how to improve that situation. Um, but I hope this gives you a little bit of a glimpse of, of actually working with agent-based models. Um, okay, so that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't have any logic installed, please uh, install it on your computers so that we can run other example models like this in coming sessions. But this bit of interaction will set us up well for some conceptual material coming up in the next few lectures. Uh, conceptual material that will lay the, the groundwork for pursuing some of your projects in this area and provide some motivations for, for um, the critical role played by models like this in thinking through um, how to best uh, understand and um, manage phenomena within the world, okay? So that's all for today. I'll hold office hours now if anyone would like to join remotely or here in person. Um, oh, there's a question here. Do these models take into account people moving around during simulation and points remain static? Great question. In this model, one thing you'll find is that models differ in their scope. I'll be talking about this next time. Models differ in their scope. And some models, um, for example, there might be certain things like age or location that are treated as static. They're treated as not changing over time. Whereas in other models, those things do change. So we might have people aging. We might have people, uh, for example, uh, uh, engaged in, uh, in mobility. And indeed, many agent-based models that we'll be working with, including some of the others I've provided you up on that Canvas site uh, just for today, have mobility uh, in place. Two of the three models have agents moving around, moving between different venues in geographic space or more, more stylized space. Um, so if you're interested in mobility, you might want to refer to, to those models. Yeah, hopefully that's, that's helpful. Okay. Um, sure. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to stop the recording here and We'll close class, but open office hours. And I'll stay right here for anyone who'd, who'd like to talk. So thank you very much. And I will go uh, close out the Zoom um, recording here. Um, so.
let's figure out how to do that. Um, there we go. Okay. And here we go.